everybody, welcome to Percussion Axiom TV. I'm your host, Tom Burrett, and this is episode number 83. Um, today we're going to continue on our series discussing um, all kinds of geeky stuff about uh, John Saley's Night Rhapsody. So we started the series in episode 82. If you haven't seen it yet, press stop. And go back to 82 and check that out. And uh, I think it'll uh, be nice to get you in from the beginning here. Um, so this is episode 83, and today we're going to talk about, um, today's axiom really centers around academic, it's academic. Okay, so basically that's academic understanding. What about music do we need to know to perform things better? Historical information, uh, theoretical information. That's really going to be the focus moving forward through this series as I prepare Night Rhapsody for performance at PASIC in Indianapolis in November. So, um, you know, this is a really big issue for me. Uh, I think, you know, many of us have taken many theory classes, history classes, and we don't always connect to that information that we learned there to this, to playing. What does that all that mean, um, and how can we use it to help us? So that's going to be a significant part of um, the series of episodes coming up, and that process, I think, fits perfectly um, with this particular piece. So um, that's going to be the theme moving forward. So as we get into today's episode, we're going to talk just a little bit about the thematic material in Night Rhapsody, Go ahead and uh, follow along if you got a score. I'll leave a link somewhere, uh, maybe in the show notes um, or on the post at Drum Chatter um, to, to uh, Steve Weiss so you can, so you can purchase the music. I invite you to do that because um, I think that'll really help having the score in front of you. I know some of you have done that already and that's really exciting to see. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of, before we get into the nitty gritty of the thematic materials, um, rhythmic motives, etc., in this, we're going to just talk a little bit about some even more general stuff. Um, that's really the best place to start when you're looking at a piece. Um, this is a rhapsody, okay? Uh, so we're gonna get into what that means from a formal uh, standpoint. But before we do that, we're gonna get to this thing called postmodernism. Um, in the very early 80s, probably started even in the late 70s, but well, right around when this, was, this piece was written, there was a, um, uh, a sort of an ism that was happening that later would be called a postmodernism. And so I just want to um, connect this piece to that greater movement um, to composers worldwide, as I think there's a connection there, okay? Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from my dissertation that I wrote on this piece and, and, uh, and um, Schwantner's um, uh, Velocities, and just to kind of sh shed some back light onto what postmodernism is. So to understand postmodernism, is, is, it is necessary to comprehend the ideals of modernism. Eric Salzman's 20th century music and introduction describes modernism as being driven entirely by idealism derived from the German romantic philosophy. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I continue here. An idealism driven by a tradition rooted in achieving compositional perfection. You know, it started before Beethoven, of course, but, you know, Beethoven's famous for crossing, constant, constantly crossing, editing, changing. He wanted perfection in every way. And so that idea keeps going. Music as an art form was reconstructed and formed from its own internal logic, a logic consisting of thought, process, and form, producing music that was internal and personal. Its characteristics included either randomness or specific order, both at times producing the same result. So it's just the idea, you know, uh, he, didn't, he doesn't say the word serialism here, but just the ultra control of everything and how that most of the time, as tightly controlled as it was, it didn't, it sounded, some, most of the time is sort of random, okay? So postmodernism is really a reaction to that, okay? It's a reaction against those ideals and it has a main goal of reestablishing the composer-performer-public relationship because a lot of those, you know, angular or serialistic pieces um, obviously weren't a lot to listen to and the public sort of, you know, sort of came apart from that composer and performer and uh, public relationship that was evident earlier. Um, a postmodernist achieved this by composing works that referred to a preceding implication. So series is a, is a really good example of that, meaning that we've got evidence of sonata form, of course, which is an older uh, form. Uh, we've got DS Erie theme, we'll talk about later. We've got circle fifth progressions. We've got other unifying elements that really are connected to the past, the romantic past, really. So that is definitely a postmodernist issue. So it's good to have that kind of background and understanding when you learn something. Uh, it can shed a lot of general light on some of the decisions you have to make in the performance process. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about um, what postmodernism is and connecting that piece to that sort of worldwide general movement, um, 
we uh, we could talk a little bit about the form. What is a rhapsody? Okay, you, you're familiar with other rhapsodies, I'm sure. I hear often when people talk about this piece that they're, you know, I just don't understand the piece. It just, I don't understand the form. It seems so random. It seems to go all over the place. Well, guess what, guys? That's kind of the point. It's a rhapsody. A rhapsody, by definition, sort of implies freedom from a formal nature. Okay, so um, if we find the sheet here, if we go back a little bit further into my paper, actually back sooner, um, we get some information on kind of really what defines a rhapsody. Um, what we get, if I can find it here, um, Rupert Hughes defines the rhapsody as a brilliant composition which combines the idea of a medley with the acquired idea of great joy or ecstasy. And as we get into this piece, you're going to see, guys, that um, there is definitely ecstasy. <laughs> and I'm not sure about joy, but definitely emotions of that nature. Okay. Um, there are several aspects that are associated with the rhapsodic genre that Sari thought would serve as me as well. Primarily, it implied freedom, right? This gives the composer a bit more freedom, especially in the more development sections. Um, he wasn't tied down to necessarily a strict, specific order. Um, that's definitely a romantic era concept. Secondly, as it described by Wollman Source, during the 19th century, its utterance, the uh, um, uh, rhapsody, became more ebullient and high-flown, and its emotion more uncontrolled. Okay, and so as we go through this piece, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. The emotion of this piece just is, it's, it's not only highly emotional, it's uber-emotional, and we've got to capture that in the performance of the work. Otherwise, we're missing a huge part of it. So I hope you can see the importance of all of that information that we just talked about in the understanding of how we're gonna interpret this piece. Okay, so now that we've laid that groundwork, um, please do what you can to remember all of that as we go forward into episode and episode here. I um, wanted to continue today and talk about um, the main, we're just gonna talk about the introduction here and then the coda on the other side. Um, rhapsody, while he, is, he does call it a rhapsody, there actually, if you, if you look at it pretty closely from a formal nature, you do see pretty clear um, sonata form, okay? Which kind of surprised me as, we, as I got as I got to dig deeper into, the, into exploring the form of this. Um, and typically, in a sonata form, we've got an introduction and an outro, okay? So, um, and typically those, that material is identical or very similar in nature. So, that's what we're gonna focus with today. Um, so, <clears throat> the introduction, let's talk about unifying elements to postmodernism, okay? The first thing that we see here that connects it to the past in some way is a circle of fifths. So for the left hand in the opening measures, we have this. C to F to B to E to A. So that's a very clear circle of fifths progression. This is something that you see numerous times in the piece. So that's unifying element number one to postmodernism. Um, the second thing we see in the introduction is a rhythmic modem of three, right? Remember back to your history classes. Um, the, even before the Romantic era, there was Bach did this a lot. Like in the Chaconne, for example, there was a clear focus on the number three. Uh, and we've got that all over the place. Right after the opening lick, uh, the, the cadence point on A is three. Then we've got an ostinato on the left hand. It's all based on three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's the uh, a rhythmic aspect, rhythmic motive aspect of connecting the two postmodernism to something in the past. And then we've got, of course, the main theme of the piece right here in the, in the introduction, which is this sort of seven, min, uh, seven note motive. That obviously doesn't sound like something that maybe Bach would have written uh, or something here in the past. Um, but in, in, you know, that's now that we're getting into the thematic of the piece, we're getting into more of what he brings to the table from a you know sort of more modern 20th century sense. So it's really that, um, those issues that we're gonna focus a lot on over the next hopefully six, seven weeks is how Sari, um, there's a really interesting dichotomy in the way that he controls the themes, the thematic materials, the, the, the rhythmic motives, and it's so tightly controlled, but at the same time he throws that into the idea of a rhapsody, which is which somehow implies freedom, the opposite sort of thing. So hopefully you understand that dichotomy. So here's the introduction of the piece, um, and it's slightly under tempo because I'm still working this thing up. And then I'll go ahead and show you the end, the the coda as well. <laughs> Okay, so there's the introduction.
introduction, you can hear all the, the circle of fifths at the very beginning, the clear rhythmic mode of three, and then followed by the main theme of the piece there at the end. So here's the same music at the end, it's a little bit shorter. We get the circle of fifths, followed by a very dramatic and clear presentation of the main theme. Here's the coda. So you can clearly see here, see the similar themes between the two there. That's obviously the very beginning of the piece and the very end of the piece. What we're going to get into next time is talking about the uh, exposition. So theme A and theme B. Um, that's what we'll head to next time. Um, there'll be a thread inside the drum chatter forms. Um, I guess I'll put it under the title of John Sari, Night, Night Rhapsody for Marimba. If you guys have thoughts, I know Andy Harnsberger, who's played this piece perhaps more than anyone on the planet, has done some work on this piece as well. And I'd love to hear, Andy, your thoughts. Thanks for checking it out. And anyone else have comments? Or we're going to start a long thread, hopefully, to give you guys lots of opportunity to share and, and ask questions. And again, remember from 82, we want this to be as interactive as possible. All right, that's today's episode. Hope you guys found that helpful. I know it's getting a little geeky. Um, I find this stuff fascinating. I hope you do too. Um, but I'm really interested in in kind of sharing some of this information and getting your thoughts. So, question of the episode. How do you guys handle this whole idea of understanding something from an academic perspective and how that relates to how you play something? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. There's lots of ways of doing it, of course. This is just one of them. Um, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So, the comments of Drum Chatter, um, if you, you know, you guys all know lots of people. If you think there's an opportunity for someone you know that would really kind of like this, please spread the word about it. And that's it for today's show. Thank you guys so much, and we'll, we'll see you next time.